This is Epicenter, episode 357 with guest McLean Wilkison. Hi, I'm Sebastian Couture, and you're listening to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. On this show, we dive deep to learn how things work at a technical level, and we fly high to understand visionary concepts and long-term trends. If you like Epicenter, there's only one way that you can support us that's super easy and costs nothing, and that's to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. If you're on a Mac, an iPhone, or an iPad, pick up your device and go to epicenter.rocks apple, and that'll take you exactly where you need to go to leave us an Apple Podcast review. And I know it sounds complicated because you got to think about what you're going to write, but here, I'll give you some examples. You can tell us how long you've been listening to the show. You can tell us who's your favorite host. You can share, you know, one thing that you learned on this podcast. Heck, you can even share your super secret, you know, yield hacking, sushi farming strategy, if you like. All the reviews that we get help establish Epicenter as the leading technical podcast in the crypto space, and it helps people find it. So thanks so much to everybody who's left us a review already. I love getting those Slack notifications and being able to read those reviews. And thanks in advance to everybody who I know will leave us an Apple podcast review in the next couple of days. So with that out of the way, I'd like to now introduce our guest for today's episode. It is McLean Wilkinson, and he is the co-founder and CEO of NewCypher. NewCypher is a company that is providing cryptographic infrastructure for privacy-preserving applications, and this infrastructure exists as a smart contract on the Ethereum blockchain. They're in testnet currently, but they'll be launching soon, and when they do, you'll be able to use NewCypher to do something called proxy re-encryption. Proxy re-encryption is a cryptographic method that allows you to delegate re-encryption of data to a third party, in this case, validators in the new Cypher network. So let's take an example. Let's say you have Alice and she has encrypted data that's stored up in the cloud or on, on a centralized cloud service or a decentralized cloud service like IPFS, and she wants that data to be sent to a third party, Bob. One way to do that would be to download the data, decrypt it, and then re-encrypt it with Bob's public key put it back up in the cloud where Bob can have access to it. Well, that might work in some cases, but it's a little bit cumbersome as it implies that Alice has to do this operation every time she wants to send data to someone else. With proxy re-encryption, you issue this re-encryption key that is assigned to a specific public key, and then a third party has the ability to re-encrypt data for that third party to decrypt. And so in this case, it is the new Cypher network that is acting as that third party service. And of course, the owner of the data can then revoke that key if necessary. So this is interesting use cases for things like sharing medical records, but you know, could also imagine it used in something like a decentralized Dropbox where you might want to share files with a specific person and then revoke access later on. Another interesting thing about NewCypher is their token distribution mechanism. They're doing something they're calling a work lock, which is essentially like a lock drop, but with actual work involved. So in a more quote-unquote traditional lock drop, like the Edgeware lock drop, for example, you, you lock up some ETH, and at the end of the lock period, well, you get back your ETH and you get your allocated tokens. In the new Cypher work lock, the participants actually have to do some work. So they're going to have to run a validator for a period of six months. That validator is pinging the smart contract every day, and at the end of the lock period, they get back their ETH as well as the allocated tokens. And so this is an interesting way to bootstrap the network with you know, actual participants, people who are actually providing value to the network. Of course, there's a number of challenges around this, specifically regarding transaction fees, which we get into during the interview. This episode is brought to you by Algorand. Algorand has built a sophisticated platform that allows developers to build equally sophisticated applications. So they've built a layer one protocol that has all the primitives that you need to build DeFi apps. So things like token issuance and atomic transfers are built right into the protocol. But I'll tell you a little bit more about that later on in the interview. For now, though, here's our conversation with McLean Wilkison. We're here with McLean Wilkison. He's the co-founder and CEO of NewCypher. And NewCypher is a platform for I'll let McLean describe it, but I would describe it as you know building infrastructure for things like key management and secure multi-party computation or fully homomorphic encryption. I think we'll get into the nuts and bolts. Thanks for joining us. 
Thank you guys for having me. I'm very excited to chat about NewCypher. Tell us a bit about your background and how you became involved in the crypto space. My background is kind of this weird blend of uh, you know, technology and software engineering, but also uh, traditional finance. So out of undergrad, I worked for a couple years in M&A and capital advisory at Morgan Stanley, helping you know, large corporations in the tech and media and telecom sector go public or raise you know, debt capital, things like that, or mergers and acquisitions. And then left after two years and moved out to the Bay Area and started concurrent with that, started getting very interested in Bitcoin and you know sort of this new thing that hadn't quite happened yet, but they were sort of Vitalik was on his roadshow for Ethereum, kind of pitching the, the upcoming ICO, and uh, was working out of a hacker space and randomly ended up in kind of a meetup where Vitalik was pitching Ethereum and what it was, and randomly just happened to sit in, in that and like didn't understand anything that he was talking about, but thought it sounded super interesting and had been kind of aware of, of Bitcoin, obviously, when I had been working at Morgan Stanley, but never had really had time to dig into it, but just got very interested in sort of this new or potentially new industry and felt like it was a really exciting time to be involved when this was back when sort of, you know, Counterparty and MasterCoin and things like that were happening. So we did some early experiments on top of those protocols just to try to understand like what sorts of things could we build on this? Um, you know, is it interesting? Like what are the problems that it's trying to solve? And then uh, ended up actually kind of staying in the cryptography space and moving a little bit away from blockchain for a little while. My co-founder and I, Michael Lorov, who's now uh, running Curve, we actually started the company building a, an end-to-end -end encrypted database that had was kind of inspired by the sort of early experiments that we had been doing in blockchain with Counterparty, but really was just you know a traditional database that allowed you to store and search uh, encrypted data without the server ever being able to see that data. So we we worked on that for a while. That was called Zero DB. It became kind of a, a relatively like popular open source project on like the Hacker News stat, but we, we could never really figure out how to monetize it. Like we were pitching large banks to use it for, you know, archiving data in the cloud, for example, but it was uh, kind of a tough road to hell on that one. And we worked on that for a couple of years. That was for the genesis of or the early precursor to New Cypher. And then we ended up doing Y Combinator in summer 16 uh, with the company. And then right after that was when the app started to become a real thing, a little bit more as opposed to kind of a theoretical thing. But we realized that a lot of the stuff that we had built for zero DB, we could kind of repurpose for use by decentralized applications or other decentralized protocols in an attempt to kind of bring this ability to do access control and share private data alongside of a decentralized storage system. So kind of a long meandering path to get where we are, but have kind of always worked in and around the cryptography and, and privacy space. You mentioned zero DB and the sort of challenge that you had selling that to you know to banks and, and corporations i think like a lot of this kind of zero knowledge technology or like these encryption technologies that allow you to perform computations or like use encrypted data are like super interesting to people like us who like think about privacy and that sort of thing but i found like in my experience you know dealing with corporates and like large corporations that a lot of these companies are not necessarily interested in this stuff. And so there's often like a disconnect between like the people who are like super interested and passionate, but like, you know, check out all this cool stuff we can build about it around us. And then like the real business world that <laughs> doesn't really give a shit. I don't know if that's kind of been your experience as well and, you know, how you got around that. It was definitely a super hard thing to try to sell, you know, encryption technology and like an encrypted database into a large enterprise, especially in the financial sector. I wouldn't. Personally, probably wouldn't try to do it again. Uh, and I wouldn't sort of recommend it as a first choice uh, go to market for someone working on a startup. There are people at the, these large institutions, at these banks and you know, large, other large enterprises that are very excited about it and are very interested in it. But I think by and large, those don't overlap with the people who are able to like make the purchase decision. So you'll have these like, interesting technical conversations with people and you'll be excited about you know what they could potentially use it for. But ultimately, like they're not the person who you know, actually decide whether they're going to use it and to pay for it or not. And I think that's one of the, really one of the most exciting things for me as a, you know, an entrepreneur in, in the blockchain space is that like, that's where there is a huge amount of overlap between the people who are just intrinsically interested in this stuff and who have the ability to just immediately start using something because either they're running a project or, you know, they're just, there is a high degree of overlap there. So it's like much more the early adopters are you know, able to actually deploy stuff early on. 
so that's super exciting, you know, as, as a founder and a developer is like, as soon as you build something interesting, there's much lower of a hurdle for people to actually start using it. What are some of those hurdles? I mean, you know, if you look at sort of privacy preserving technologies more broadly, probably we're all users of Signal here, for example. We're super excited about like privacy preserving technologies and we'll like, you know, get our non-technical friends to get on these things and stuff and start using them. What are some of the hurdles that you've encountered in getting people to understand the value and the kind of utility of privacy preserving technologies? And, you know, are there some things that just as most people will never really be able to pass off? Yeah, I think the unfortunate reality of trying to sell technology to large enterprise is that it's much more about like the enterprise sales mission and how good you are, how good your org is at that than it is about the technology. So do you have these sort of enterprise sales org that can reach these customers, that can reach influence these decision makers? There's a whole lot of sort of committee and, and bureaucracy that you have to do to get sort of particularly something like this, where it started touching their core infrastructure and its encryption and it's very sensitive and it has regulatory and compliance implications for the end user. Like there's a lot of layers of approval that you have to go through. You have to go through compliance. They're going to want to know who your you know, institutional backers are. They're going to want to know who your existing customers are because no one wants to be like the first bank to adopt something and then you know, it goes wrong. I think like if you're building enterprise technology and selling top down to like CIOs or CTOs, it's much less, unfortunately, about like the technology, much more about the sort of enterprise sales motion and whether you have that expertise inside of your organization. And that's just not, I think, for at least for me, is like not really a salesperson. That's not something that I'm <laughs> especially, particularly like intrinsically interested in. With zero DB, what were some of the like technology that you had to use there? Was it like, and how like related was it to like sort of the stuff you ended up building at NewCypher? So zero DB was actually quite simple. Um, so it, it was an encrypted data and an encrypted database where you would encrypt everything client side before you upload it to the server and the server would never see the plain text data. So usually when you say that people are like, oh, it must be like fully homomorphic encryption. It was not, it was much, much simpler than that. So basically we would uh, like remotely and incrementally traverse like a B tree index. So we'd encrypt this index client side, send it to the server and then like when we want to search for something, we'd ask the server for the, you know, the encrypted root of the tree, fetch that, download it, decrypt it. Then we know like which branch of the tree to go to next. And we just basically do that. So it was pretty sort of simple and kind of a, a little bit naive. It wasn't nearly like the fancy, like fully homomorphic encryption sort of paradigm that everyone is looking for. So it just sold sort of like a client side search, but like a smarter way of like doing it basically. Exactly. Um, so like you couldn't really use it for applications that were performance sensitive, but you could use it maybe for things that you didn't really need to get a result back quickly. So like the use case that we were pitching to, to enterprises was you can use this to archive stuff. So a lot of banks at the time and still currently, I think, are basically just have it, archiving everything on prem using like tapes. Whereas if using uh, zero DB, they could theoretically throw that into you know some cloud storage like AWS Glacier or something, but still never expose anything to Amazon but be able to query back, you know, if a regulatory a regulator asked for something from, you know, eight, 10 years ago. So that was the basic technology. And then we also built in this functionality to allow other people to query that encrypted data as well. And that was how we discovered this uh, technology called proxy re-encryption. Without proxy re-encryption, obviously, whoever has the key, basically the person who encrypted a client side is the only one who can query, you know, a zero DB database. But we started getting interested in proxy re-encryption because then like the enterprise could enable partners, whether it's like a supplier, a regulator, or a customer, whoever, to also, they could delegate access to that encrypted data and allow them to do the search as well. And that ended up actually becoming like the, I think the most interesting part of ZeroDB was this ability to sort of delegate access to encrypted data. And that's ultimately kind of what morphed into sort of this, the first iteration of the new Cypher network, which is basically a, new, a decentralized network of a bunch of nodes that perform this proxy re-encryption function. The basic idea of, of zero DB we sort of left behind, but this proxy re-encryption or delegation to encrypted data is what we kind of pulled out and eventually became New Cipher. You briefly mentioned tape drives there, and like as you were talking about, I like I googled tape storage, and the first result is like IBM selling these massive like these things still exist, and companies still buy machines to store like petabytes of data on tapes. This is wild. I didn't know this was still a thing. I think it's not an infrequent scenario where like you have something stored on a tape and you 
you know, 10 years later, a regulator comes and says, hey, I need access to this data. And you go and you get the tape. And it takes a couple of days to get the tape out of storage. And you upload the tape. And then it like turns out all the data is corrupted because the tape got, I don't know, damaged or something. Yeah, because like magnetic data, you know, magnetic storage, what could go wrong? <laughs> it's pretty terrible. So moving on to New Cipher, when you started working on New Cipher, like what was your your goal and like what were you trying to achieve with this and what kind of convinced you that there was a problem worth solving here? Basically, we made this sort of pivot back to blockchain. This would have been probably early 2017, right when we saw like, hey, DApps are kind of becoming a thing and like right before the whole totally bizarre craziness that happened after that uh, in the ICO world. But we kind of, the reason why we had decided not to stay to build ZeroDB originally not for blockchain was just because it was too early. Like at the time, you know, back in 2013, 2014, like the idea of dApps was a thing that people were talking about, but there were no dApps at all uh, or meaningful dApps. So like we basically decided, hey, whatever we build, like it doesn't matter because there's no one around that is actually going to use it. At the beginning of 2017, I think that it felt like that was starting to change. So we sort of identified this sort of gap that we saw was, you know, everyone's building these you know, public blockchains, these decentralized storage layers like IPFS and Swarm and Sia, but there's not really a good way to build access controls into your application. Yes, you can encrypt data client side before you upload it to, you know, IPFS storage or something like that. But if you want to share that data later on with another user of the application, it's kind of difficult. Either you can just give them the key, which is not particularly secure, or you know, whoever encrypted it originally has to download the data, decrypt it, encrypt it with the recipient's key and send it to them. So it's a bit clunky. And so the idea was basically we could use proxy re-encryption to make this a lot smoother of an experience where you could, as a user, let's say, you know, a simple example would be you know, you're building some sort of electronic health records application on IPFS. Uh, you could encrypt those records before you upload them to the storage. And then later on, you can use New Cipher to like, delegate access to that encrypted data to a doctor or a hospital insurance company, something like that. And what the New Cipher network can do is basically take that encrypted data and re-encrypt or transform it such that it's now encrypted under the recipient's key without having to decrypt in the middle. We built a lot on top of this basic proxy re-encryption functionality to make it a little bit more user-friendly. So you can attach, like a, we call it a policy, where you can attach certain conditions to sharing that the network uh, will enforce. So you only want to share between you know, some certain you know, time period, or maybe you want to revoke access later, things like that. Or maybe you want to condition it on the recipient paying you for, that, for access to the data first. We added a little bit of like uh, fancy stuff on top, but that core functionality of being able to delegate access was a gap that we saw of kind of like making it easier to work with private data in a decentralized app. Back in January, we interviewed Steve Kokinos and Sylvia McCalley of Algorand. And during our conversation, we talked about how Algorand's unique design makes it easy for developers to build sophisticated applications on their platform. So what's great about Algorand, beyond the fact that it's fast, it's secure, it scales, and it has instant finality, is the fact that they've designed a layer one protocol with primitives that are purpose-built for DeFi. So what that means is that they've taken some of the most common things that people do with smart contracts and they've embedded them right in the system, right in the layer one. So things like issuing tokens, atomic transfers, well, these are built into the layer one and smart contracts are first class citizens on Algorand. So with these essential building blocks at your disposal, you can build fast and secure DeFi apps in no time. To learn more about what Algorand brings to the table and how to get started, I would encourage you to check out algorand.com slash epicenter. That lets them know that you heard about it from us and it takes you where you need to go to learn about their tech. And with that, we'd like to thank Algorand for supporting the podcast. What are some use cases where the proxy re-encryption would be desirable over the system where I just, you know, download the data myself, decrypt it and re-encrypt it for someone else? Like the proxy, is it cheaper computationally or where would I rather use proxy re-encryption? We have a blog post that goes into like, like a couple specific details, but I think a big one is that it doesn't require you, let's say you're Alice, you're the person who encrypts and uploads the data. You can create these policies either the time you upload the data or any time in the future. If you didn't have proxy re-encryption and you decided you wanted to share the data with your doctor or your health records with your doctor, you'd have to come back online, you'd have to download that data, you'd have to decrypt it, encrypt it, and send it to them. Whereas with a new cipher policy, you can just specify this policy, say, share all of my data that gets created from my heart monitor, for example, 
with my doctor. And then you can issue that policy to network and you can just come back online to download and share that data. So it's a little bit better of like sort of a user experience. It doesn't require this sort of, you know, explicit Alice to be online. And it's also nice if like you're sharing the data across multiple recipients, it's just a lot cleaner to issue these policies as opposed to downloading it and then you know, encrypting it you know, five times to share with five different people. Let's maybe pause on proxy rate encryption a little bit here and maybe dissect what that means and like who the participants are. So for example, let's use this medical records example. I have a medical record that I got from, say, one healthcare provider and had to pass it on to another healthcare provider. That data is encrypted. It's on any sort of cloud server. It could be like a centralized or decentralized cloud server. If I want to be able to pass that data on to a third party, I would have to decrypt that data, re-encrypt it with their keys so that they can decrypt it. And that requires, like you said, me for be, to be online. And it's like, it's an action that I have to take. Whereas with proxy re-encryption, you essentially delegate re-encryption authority, in this case, to New Cipher, to a third party. And New Cipher, or the, the sort of delegate, re-encrypts the data in such a way that the third participant can decrypt it. Is that accurate? That's pretty close. So I think it's use- it's actually helpful just to think of it in like the traditional like Alice and Bob kind of cryptography narrative. So you have Alice, who I guess in this example would be the patient, and she has some you know, health data that she is her you know personal private data. She's the one who encrypts that data and, and uploads it somewhere. That could be a decentralized storage layer, it could be S3, it could be wherever. It doesn't make a difference. At that point, she's the only one who can access the data. She's the only one who has the key. So along comes Bob. Maybe her doctor, who want, she wants to share data with. Traditionally, she can either just basically, she can either share her key with Bob, she can share her key with the storage layer so that the storage layer can decrypt it and share it with Bob, or she can download that data, decrypt it, encrypt with Bob's key, and then send it directly to him. What proxy re-encryption does is basically introduce this third character into the Alice and Bob narrative. And at New Cypher, we call this character Ursula. And Ursula is basically this remote proxy who can re-encrypt the data such that it goes from being encrypted under Alice's key to being encrypted under Bob's key. So you have Alice, the data owner, you have Bob, the data recipient, and you have Ursula, the proxy. And Ursula is untrusted or is there like some trust required in Ursula? Ursula is trusted to be like available and online, but she is not trusted with any private key material or the plain text. So she has no ability to you know, access the data. What Alice will do is she says, okay, I want to share my data with Bob. She will create something called a re-encryption key on her client. And this re-encryption key has basically two inputs. One is Alice's private key and the other is Bob's public key. And the creation of a re-encryption key is one way. So you can't take a re-encryption key and like pull out the private key afterwards. And the only thing this re-encryption key can do is do this transformation or re-encryption that we've been talking about. And so she will send that re-encryption key to Ursula, and Ursula would then be able to use that re-encryption key to transform and re-encrypt the data for Bob. And so a re-encryption key is tied to a particular recipient, so Ursula can't re-encrypt that data for Charlie or Dave or Evan. She can only re-encrypt it for Bob. There's still an action on behalf of Alice for every new recipient. But since Ursula is always online... Ursula or some kind of like server side thing, or in this case a blockchain perhaps, can sort of notify Alice that Bob is trying to access this data. And so therefore here, can you create a re-encryption key so that the process is kind of seamless? Is that kind of how to think about it? If Bob tried to access data that he, that Ursula did not have a re-encryption key for, it just wouldn't work. So Ursula wouldn't necessarily notify Alice. There would be some sort of side channel way that, you know, Alice and Bob might communicate, say, hey, I, Bob will tell Alice, hey, I want access to the data. And Alice will say, okay, I'll create this re-encryption key for you. And she can either do that, you know, at the time that she uploads data, or she can do that anytime later in the future. Like if she switches doctors, she can tell her, so, hey, please delete or revoke this re-encryption key for Bob and, you know, accept this new re-encryption key for Charlie, for example. So basically the new Cypher network is decentralized service that provides this proxy re-encryption uh, functionality. It's a decentralized Ursula, is what you're saying. Correct, yeah. The new cyber network is actually more than that. It's sort of more of a generic threshold cryptography network, and proxy re-encryption is just kind of the first primitive on top of that. But theoretically, you know, people could deploy Shamir secret sharing or threshold signatures or really any kind of threshold cryptography onto the network through these Ursulas. 
it might be useful also just because it's been a while since we've talked about it. It also be helpful for me to get some refresh. So we, we've talked about threshold signatures in the past. One episode comes to mind when we talk with the folks at Zengo. They're, they have this, this threshold signature Bitcoin wallet. Can you just kind of refresh our memories on what our threshold signature is exactly and like the dynamics there? Threshold signatures is basically just um, if Alice can sign something, threshold signatures are basically just splitting up the ability to sign something across some multiple parties. So instead of Alice being able to sign something unilaterally, it requires say, M of N, um, you know, three of five of the sort of shareholders to sign something in order to create a valid signature. Why you called Ursula Ursula? Is there some like cryptographer inside joke there? I think it was just meant to sort of hint sort of like Ursula is untrusted. So uh, untrusted Ursula. Depending on your definition of untrusted is correct. Like I, I would I would say it's more like trust minimized. So I don't like the word trustless or untrusted, but that was kind of the original impetus. So Ursula, with proxy re-encryption at least, even if uh, Ursula has no ability to get access to the private key or the plain text, but you still are reliant on Ursula or a new cipher's case, uh, a quorum of Ursula's to be online and available. So if the whole network goes down, obviously there's no one available to perform the proxy re-encryption service. So it's not trustless in that sense. You still are sort of reliant on them being online. And we have we try to build in like certain economic guarantees through you know this sort of staking process that Ursula's have to do in order to encourage them to be online. But um, that's basically yeah, the, the idea is that they are, are trust minimized. How does this conditional proxy re-encryption work, though? Is, do I basically have to pre-give a re-encryption key to the Ursula and then the Ursula maintains it, you know, decides when to do the re-encryption based on the policies? Or do I only share the encryption key once the policy is met? So it's the former. So we've been talking uh, so far in the context of like there's one re-encryption key and one Ursula. With the new Cypher network, it's actually a little bit more sophisticated because we split that re-encryption key up into a bunch of shares, um, you know, similar to the idea of threshold signatures. So instead of having one Ursula with one re-encryption key, we'll chop, Alice will chop the key up into you know, three of five or five of ten, or this is configurable on her side, and then she will send those ten shares out to ten different nodes or ten different Ursulas in the network. And there'll be some quorum of them that have to all sort of come together to do the re-encryption successfully. And a policy is basically Alice will just attach some conditions that she wants the Ursula to enforce. So this, unfortunately, this is not you know enforced at the cryptography layer. This is enforced basically by the Ursula saying, I will enforce this uh, condition. So it could be like you know, a time condition where she only wants, Alice only wants to share data you know, after some certain date time. Or maybe Alice later on, she wants to revoke access. And as long as six of 10 of those Ursula's obey, like act appropriately and delete the re-encryption key, the revocation will be successful. So the policy piece or the conditional piece is more trusted. It's at the blockchain layer, like at a smart contract layer, more so than at the cryptography layer. Correct. Yeah. And are there like sort of punishments? Like, so, you know, one of the challenges I know with a lot of threshold cryptography is that like... A lot of schemes are possible, but then when you want like attributability, that's sort of when a lot of the stuff becomes more challenging. So how attributable are Byzantine faults or faults in this sort of scheme? So the proxy encryption piece is, is attributable. So basically what happens is every time an Ursula does a re-encryption, she has to sign that re-encryption as well. So you will know which Ursula node did the re-encryption. And uh, if an Ursula node provides like a, a false re-encryption, like she just returns garbage data, for example, there'll be a proof attached that they can take and they can submit to the blockchain and the Ursula stake would get slashed. There's really two modes of misbehavior for an Ursula. One is that incorrectness, just returning basically garbage data. And the other is just not replying at all or not responding at all. What about doing a re-encryption when they weren't supposed to? Yeah, so that one's a little bit trickier. Currently, the network would not slash for that because the policy, the a condition that the Ursula herself knows, so there's no way for like the blockchain, at least currently, to be aware of these conditions. It would require like a quorum of the Ursulas to all do that. Is there any way to like add this in in the future where like, you know, let's say I go and bribe some Ursulas to re-encrypt for me, but then I actually turn around and submit that to the blockchain where I say like, hey, Here's proof that these Ursula's re-encrypted data for me when there was the original owner did not give them the right to slash them and give me part of the reward. So kind of like 
gives an incentive for people to try to trick the Ursula so that way they're higher on their guard. Kind of the nice thing about proxy re-encryption specifically, and why we chose it for the first sort of primitive to deploy into the network, is that it's a little bit different from, let's say, like Shamir secret sharing or, or threshold signatures, where if you have a sufficient number of Ursulas colluding, they still can't really do anything on their own. So let's say you have a 5 of 10 policy and you get five malicious Ursulas that all agree to sort of re-encrypt outside of the conditions that were specified in the policy. They can't really do anything without also colluding with Bob. So it requires Bob to collude with a quorum of Ursulas in order to get sort of early access to the data, which isn't good, but it's better than just the Ursulas being able to do that on their own, which is one of the issues that you do have, you know, if you're doing threshold cryptography uh, for a signature or just some mere secret sharing where you're basically a quorum of Ursulas can reassemble the private key, essentially. So there's not, at least right now, sort of good ways that we're aware of to sort of prevent this. And it's one of the reasons why when we talk about deploying like other cryptography uh, threshold primitives to the network, like signatures or you know, things like that, unfortunately, you have to lot, rely a lot more, I think, on like the sort of the economic piece, which is you know, obviously much less robust and, and definitely scary if you had to think through that quite a bit. And we certainly, you know, to the extent that we or others deploy these other primitives onto the network, it would be something that we'd, you know, want a, a much more robust answer to first. I was talking to one of my friends, Dave Oja, and he was saying that, like, you know, there's actually not many libraries for even like normal proxy re-encryption and sort of your guys' threshold proxy re-encryption is sort of one of the wor- first systems that does proxy re-encryption. So is the reason for the threshold, is it only to enable things like the policies and stuff like that? Or is there actually reasons why like cryptographically, like threshold proxy re-encryption is actually easier to accomplish than like, you know, having one server provide proxy re-encryption? I don't know. I, I think threshold proxy re-encryption is, is, is not easier. Uh, I mean, with our library, uh, which is Pi Umbral, you can do just a one of one threshold. So technically you could do, you know, a one proxy. But I think the reason why we want the threshold is a couple things. One, it makes the availability guarantee is a lot higher. So I think if you have one proxy and that proxy goes offline for whatever reason, either maliciously or just non-maliciously, like you're out of luck and you can't do anything. Whereas, you know, if you have a quorum of Ursula's, that's hopefully much less likely. I think historically there have not been any sort of production ready sort of proxy encryption libraries before our library. Perhaps a lot of that is just, um, you know, I think where proxy encryption signs a lot more is in this sort of decentralized setting where you have many different Ursula's as opposed to just one. Is there a way to like account for Sir Ursula's changing? So let's say I like, you know, initially had these 10 Ursula's assigned to my key, my data and my policies, but let's say a couple of them drop out. Is it possible to add more Ursula's into this system? Can I use this in some like really long time frame? So like one of the examples I think would be really useful for this is like some sort of dead man switch for my data where, you know, I have a repository that has all my passwords and my crypto keys and everything. And I want them to be transferred only upon like, you know, some dead man switch kind of mechanism. But, you know, who knows? That might be 30, 40 years from now. So is there a way to do this on that kind of time horizons? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. So currently, the way that the network policy works is you as Alice, you basically specify some lifetime for the policy. And when you issue the policy, the network will only send shares of the policy to nodes that have staked for either the lifetime of your policy or longer. So let's say you specify a policy lifetime of like six months, that policy will only get issued to nodes in the network that have a remaining stake duration of six months or more. It won't send it to you know, an Ursula that's gonna, their, whose stake is going to expire in three months. But there's not a good way. Basically, like once a, an Ursula has staked for a year, that kind of like maxes out the sort of the incentives for her. So she won't earn more inflation in that case beyond her a stake duration of a year. So right now, there's not a great way to do these ultra long-lived policies. So basically what you would do is like after the end of one year, you would just reissue the policy for, you know, another year. Although we are doing some work on trying to make the network stateless so that you wouldn't have to specify a specific set of Ursulas for a policy, but really any Ursula in the network would be able to enforce the policy. 
so Tux on our team has been doing a lot of work on, on sort of how we can make the network sort of a stateless threshold cryptography network, which would have a lot of benefits, including sort of this, but um, it would open up sorts of use cases. So even if a bunch of your, the Ursulas in your quorum go away forever, as long as the network's there, other Ursulas would be able to step in. That's not there right now. That won't be there at the sort of the, at the genesis of the network in, in October. But I think it's a really interesting medium to longer term piece that I do think is, is possible and that we're working on. Hmm. Can you give us like a brief like on like how that might work? How do, would that mean like every time an Ursula drops off, they would pass on the key, their part of the key to a new Ursula? Or what would that look like? Uh, I, I actually have not dug in yet to sort of the mechanics of how, how it is. I think he's um, got it. So I can't really comment specifically on that. I just know that he's been he's been working quite a bit on that and, and apparently making pretty good progress. But I think I think probably in the next couple of months we'll be in a position to sort of publish some of the the work that he's been doing on on how that might work um, at least at a sort of mathematic and cryptography level. And so on your website, you mentioned that like you know you guys are working on this like threshold encryption stuff. And the other thing you're working on is fully homomorphic encryption. One, first off, like, is proxy encryption like a subset of FHE, or is this like a complete sort of two completely different technologies? I'd say they're pretty distinct. So you can maybe think of proxy encryption. You can maybe argue that it's fully, it's like a subset of homomorphic encryption because it's like operating on this encrypted data and it's doing this transformation. Um, I don't know how useful it is to think of it in that way, but you could make sort of the argument that, that it is. And I technically, you could actually implement within fully homomorphic encryption, like you could do this sort of re-encryption functionality with FHE. It would be much less efficient, and I don't really see why you would do that, but like technically you could. Since fully homomorphic encryption kind of implies this ability to do arbitrary, arbitrary computations on encrypted data. But yeah, so at NewCypher, we are doing, we have done some work on FHE. Um, so like currently that's like a, I would say that's sort of distinct from the network. So we think of, at least right now, the new Cypher network is this generic threshold cryptography network where we deploy proxy re-encryption, Shamir secret sharing, threshold signatures, et cetera. And then like the FHE piece is um, you know, sort of separate. So right now we have this library called new FHE, which is a GPU accelerated uh, library that uses an FHE scheme called TFHE. But it's you know currently like the new Cypher network is not... Uh, not use, does not use new FHE and there aren't any sort of immediate plans for, for it to do so. Um, we are sort of in parallel doing a lot of sort of longer term research around whether, you know, FHE might have some applications for private smart contracts, but that's, uh, I think that's definitely a lot further out. So what are the kind of use cases that you would foresee here for, uh, you know, FHE on new cipher? Like what's the primary application for like a decentralized network that can do these kind of encryption schemes? So like new FHE is about 100x faster than just vanilla TFHE on a CPU, but it's still like at an absolute level, like quite slow. So when you think about like what use cases it could be used for, um, smart contracts are kind of interesting because they don't in general need to be fast anyway. I think some of the use cases that we've sort of been lightly exploring are like voting, or potentially if there are like use cases in, in DeFi around preventing things like front running or just sort of generic private smart contracts where you can hide the inputs to the contract or even use uh, FHE to do um, you know, private, private transfers on a blockchain. I don't think that for that last use case, it's probably not the most efficient way. I think there are sort of already in production better ways to do that now. But that's sort of the, approximately like the, the areas that we're, we're looking at for that. And like, just this is more of a general question, but FHE is one of these one of these things that gets kind of thrown around in the crypto space once in a while. And how mature is that is that technology? And you know, how is it used today in production environments? Perhaps like, what's the uh, you know state of FHE? Yeah, so I wouldn't say it's really ready for production. So our library, for example, is very much experimental. You know, it's not been audited. I wouldn't recommend to use it in production. And you can certainly pull it off GitHub and you can experiment with it. But I think it uh, is not something I'd be comfortable using for like an important application currently. In general, like outside of blockchain and outside of what we're doing at NewCypher, I think in academia and research, one of the areas that people have been spending a a ton of time on is um, 
with FHE is for machine learning. So how you can train data in a privacy, uh, you can train these machine learning models in a privacy preserving way. The main library for that is, uh, I'm blanking, I think it's C C U F H E. Um, so there are a couple different types of F H E libraries that are appropriate for sort of different use cases. The so new F H E is uh, it does arithmetic operations is good if you need like a precise result. But some of the library and the schemes that are used for machine learning have more error, so they're not precise. But that's okay if you're just you know, training a machine learning model and you don't need precise results. So they're better, basically better fit for that type of use case because they sort of relax the uh, the error and the precision requirements. Uh, but in general, I, I think outside of the blockchain space, this machine learning area is where a lot of the the current work has been happening. And I think that's still kind of at a maybe POC proof of concept level more so than you know there are people doing this in uh, in production right now. And why did you choose to focus on this? And what what do you see sort of as the promise of FHG like in, in the context of New Cipher? Yeah, so I've, the reason why we originally got interested in FHG is because, well, specifically for smart contracts, is because I think there had been several projects that had been working on private smart contracts and trying to solve that using secure multi-party computation. And I think long-term, the issue with that is secure multi-party computation just requires a huge amount of network overhead. Uh, whereas with FHE, you know, the schemes are getting better. The, you, can, you can accelerate them a lot uh, at the hardware level. So I think on a longer term, it's possible that you'll be able to do things with FHE that just aren't practical with, with SMPC. You know, whether that is actually, whether just private smart contracts in general are like that useful in a blockchain setting, I think is still a little bit to be determined. But I think there were a lot of people working on SMPC and you know, no one was really working on FHE because I think the impression was that it just wasn't practical at the moment. Um, but I think if you look at how the schemes work, I think like the, the scope for an area for improvement for FHE is potentially a lot bigger than um, you know, what you'll be able to squeeze out for, from MPC, just because at the end of the day, MPC is kind of network bound and requires a lot of uh, you know, chattiness and communication between different nodes um, that are performing a computation. You can get more privacy out of FHE, right? Because from what I understand, with an MPC, you can sort of like hide the data that goes into the MPC, but like the actual program is still public. But in FHE, that you can actually make it so like the program itself, that 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 what the contract does itself is private as well. Yeah. So one of the one of the interesting things about FHE is that um, it hides the the input is encrypted, so the Whoever's operating on the input doesn't see it. They don't see the output either. But at the same time, like the, the person who's doing the computation can be using their own proprietary model, for example. So I think in the context of like machine learning, this is one of the reasons why people are interested in it. Because let's say you're, do it, you're, you know, you're some startup who has like the best genetic sort of analysis program and it's proprietary and you don't want to share that program with others or that model with others. You can basically keep that on your own machine. People can upload their encrypted genome. You never see their genome. They never see your model. Uh, and you can give them back results um, that you don't see, but that they can decrypt. Um, so basically, keeping the model private and proprietary, but the data is well protected is, uh, I think, one of the benefits of FHG. So I wanted to ask you, what is your take on like sort of trusted hardware and like SGXs and things like this, where like, you know, there's two approaches to doing, you know, you can either use all this very cool cryptography you guys have built or, mm -hmm. but, you know, SGX comes along and says, hey, here's this magic black box piece of hardware that mm -hmm. we can do everything you're saying, but like, you know, no mag no cryptography or fancy cryptography needed. Yep. Just your general thoughts on trusted hardware and where do you think it's going to go from here? Yeah. I mean, I think short answer is that it doesn't really work, unfortunately. Uh, I and mean, the reason why people like it is because, you know, as you said, like, it's fast. You can do stuff on it today. I, but I think, like, the trade-off is that, unfortunately, just like, you know, we've seen with, you know, these sort of, with SGX in particular, it's just the most popular one. Just, I think, like, every other month, it seems like there's, like, a sort of new attack that, you know, someone's come up with. I think maybe where they, where T's have a place is, like, just as sort of one part of a broader sort of 
you know, security posture. But if your whole premise is that like this is secure and private because I'm using a T, I think that's just this is not going to work out well. I think maybe like I think it's uh, I think some folks at Berkeley are working on uh, you know an open source T called I think it's Keystone or something like that, which is interesting. Uh, you know, at least it's not you know proprietary and it's open source. I don't know like what the timing is for that, um, but I think ultimately at the end of the day, it's very difficult to design a piece of hardware that's going to you know, actually work or at least meet the sort of the all the sort of the promises and expectations that have been made around trusted execution environments. What's the unique challenge there to building the hardware as opposed to building things in software? Well, I think the nice thing about cryptography is that you can create security proofs. So it just comes down to, to math, basically. And so you have these mathematical guarantees around whether or not something is, you know, a scheme is, is secure. Obviously, like, you have to assume that the implementation is done correctly as well. But at the end of the day, it's like, the root of security for a piece of cryptography is just math. Whereas with hardware, um, you know, it's not like currently, like if you're using SGX, basically you have to assume that the reason why it's private and confidential is because essentially Intel says it is. And so you just don't have this sort of same root in, in mathematics. It's sort of the origination of the, the security guarantees. Let's talk a little bit about the, uh, let's bring it back to New Cypher and talk a little bit about the, uh, about the infrastructure. Um, so, so help us understand, you know, like, you know, if, if we're talking about the blockchain itself, you know, like who are the, the participants and what is the sort of like incentive model here? Is it a blockchain or a smart contract, first off? Yeah, so the new Cypher network is not its own blockchain. It sits on top of currently like the Ethereum network. And basically it's composed of a network of these Ursulas that are providing proxy re-encryption or you know, generic, some generic threshold cryptography. And what these Ursulas have to do is if you want to operate one of these Ursulas and run a node on the new Cypher network, you have to stake the native new Cypher token, which is uh, new. So this is, a, I think, like commonly people would call this like a work token. So if you stake the token that allows you to join the network, run a node, receive work uh, in, ex in exchange for that work, get paid by users. So Alice will pay a fee in ETH. And nodes also receive an inflation subsidy um, in new. So there's really these two, two components uh, for incentivization, incentivization to run a node. And then also there's uh, the slashing protocol where um, currently the network slashes very little, but uh, could the DAO could, uh, basically can slash for going offline for extended periods of time or providing basically like false output. So the network itself is just uh, basically a bunch of these Ursulas that are staking the token and providing this uh, this work. So it's a smart contract, and there is a there's a network of nodes that are staking the token on the contract. Yep. So there's a stake like a, there's an escrow contract where nodes will stake their their new into this contract, and that will allow them to basically start getting selected for for work orders or jobs or policies. And it will also allow them to, to basically receive some of this uh, inflation subsidy. Okay. And how does the slashing work then? Like, how does one tell the contract that the, say, the proofs or whatever the Ursulas are providing the user are, are valid? Yeah. So generally, if, if Ursula is doing everything correctly, like these proofs won't get submitted because Bob will just you know, receive his data and he'll be happy. But if Bob receives um, garbage response or just like a false re-encryption... Uh, he can take, remember, I think we said earlier that every time Ursula does a re-encryption, she will sign like a, a proof of this re-encryption, which gets basically along with the re-encrypted data is attached to that re-encrypted data and gets sent to Bob. Um, and so if Bob can't decrypt that re-encrypted data for some reason because it's garbage, he can take that uh, proof that's signed by Ursula and he can submit it to the blockchain. In this case, there's uh, we call it the adjudicator contract. And the adjudicator contract would then go ahead and, and slash that Ursula's stake. And so Ursula would be, would be punished for that. How does the adjudicator contract know that the data is garbage? Uh, so there's basically like a zero. It's the, the proof that's attached is like a proof of re-encryption. And it's signed by that particular Ursula. And so it's, it's essentially it's like a, a zero knowledge proof that's been signed by Ursula that it's easy to, to validate by, by anyone. Okay, so it's something that could be validated independently without like some kind of 
adjudication process where other parties are verifying. Uh, correct. Yeah, yeah. So adjudicator maybe is a little bit of a misnomer because okay. it's it's yeah. it's not. Uh, yeah, it's just all automatic. Okay, so this all happens automatically. How expensive is like submitting one of these proofs, especially with like current gas prices and stuff on Ethereum? That's a good question. I'm not immediately sure on the cost of submitting a, a slashing a, a proof for slashing. I will say that like in general, like the current gas situation on Ethereum has made it very difficult to run a small new cipher node. So each Ursula node is required in order to receive this inflation subsidy, they're required to basically do this sort of availability check-in daily or every period. And they do this through a, a transa- like a check-in transaction, which is about 200k gas. So previously that was like fine, but now all of a sudden it's like five, ten, maybe more dollars a day. It's unfortunately, it's kind of if you're particularly if you're running like a node with a minimum stake, that can start to get very expensive. So yeah, in general, like that's been this sort of gas situation on Ethereum has been impacting uh, particularly smaller node operators. Is there any like particular reason that new cipher benefit from being on Ethereum? Like, is there some sort of composability benefit that comes from having the like this coordination system on Ethereum? Or would it be possible to have the coordination system on its sort of like own independent blockchain, but like still be able to provide this threshold de- proxy encryption work for dApps? Yeah, so in principle, the the network would does not have to be on top of Ethereum. I think like in practice, the reason why it is on top of Ethereum is because when we started building it, Ethereum was like the only the only option. Um, and the reason why it probably still isn't on Ethereum right now is because that's right now, at least that's where most of the potential users are of dApps. But it would not it would certainly be possible to save the network state and move it to you know another smart contract platform, whether it's Cosmos or Polkadot or wherever. I think the benefit right now for it being on Ethereum is that nodes are paid for policies in ETH and just it's easier for people right now to pay in ETH than in, you know, other um, layer one currencies. There's just more people that, that hold it. But there's nothing like intrinsic to the network that it requires it to be on t- off of Ethereum. And I think like for, for New Cypher in particular, like this sort of composability aspect, which is always super important for like DeFi and things like that. You know, probably isn't as uh, isn't as compelling for New Cipher. How big is the network today, and how many Ursulas are on the network? So the network, or the main net, will be launching uh, in October, um, so, so next month. Oh, that's right. Yeah, it hasn't. It, so so after this work lock, yeah. So right now it's just uh, a test net. We had an incentivized test net back you know, like in like February and March of this year, and I think at peak we had something like a thousand ish nodes um, that were running. Um, so that was sort of nice to sort of stress test things and you'll see how whether the network holds up or falls over, you know, at that scale. Ultimately, I think about 550 node operators from the incentivized test net, like basically performed well enough that we that they earned a reward. So like just actually pretty many nodes. I think the it will be interesting to see how many of those convert into mainnet nodes. I think particularly given the gas situation right now makes it challenging for smaller node operators. So there might be some pressure towards, you know, people pooling in a couple larger nodes or, you know, it may make some of like the smaller, smaller nodes just not financially viable um, until either we come up with some, you know, solution to the gas issue or just gas costs come down. So that will be something that I think we're, we'll be watching pretty closely as we transition to mainnet. But we had, during the test nets, we had, you know, quite a few nodes up. And what are some of the things that you know that the testnet uh, revealed, or like that you've learned through that incentivized uh, testnet? Yeah, so we went through uh, actually a lot of iterations of testnet before we even got to the incentivized testnet. So like the first version of the network was literally like you know we spun up one node internally, and we had like one new cipher company Ursula, uh, and then we opened it up to a few closer partners. We had a federated network where there was no token, but there was basically like a whitelist of of people that would be running nodes. And then we introduced uh, you know, this token and the staking aspect, ran that for a couple of months, and then we basically turned on a testnet faucet where anyone could get the, to- the testnet token and they could stake and run a node. And then we got to the in- incentivized testnet. So by the time we got to the incentivized testnet, um, the network was actually pretty mature. 
what it hadn't had was obviously like, you know, the, you know, a thousand nodes running at one time. So it was definitely interesting to see you know, what happened uh, in that scenario. And then we did a ton of polishing around, you know, like just rough edges and corners and, you know, in- improve like the staking UI and, and the experience for that. What was also interesting was that we did several testnet iterations of the work lock, which is this um, basically token distribution mechanism that we we came up with. And that was kind of interesting because um, participants came up with some like theoretical edge cases and like attacks uh, on the work lock that influenced like our ultimate uh, end design for the main network lock, which is happening now. So there were some scenarios where like people could do weird things around like putting in huge bids during the contribution period, but then like canceling some stuff at the last minute so that they would end up getting like a disproportionate share of, uh, of the work lock tokens and some weird sort of attacks around that that we were able to to change in the final design that will hopefully um you know obviously to be determined but will hopefully end up in kind of a better distribution of these uh these work lock tokens than we otherwise would have seen well so what do you do in the work lock like what is the sort of work so i i you know i know it's somewhat similar to a lock drop where like you know i lock up some eth for a little bit of time but what where does the work aspect come into it Yep. So it's it's similar to lock drop in that you're yeah you're you're locking up or escrowing this ETH, and then it's different in that it has this work requirement. Um, and the work requirement in this case is you know, running a new cipher node for at least six months on mainnet. And so the work is like this. Pro- it's te- so basically we use the inflation subsidy that a node earns as a kind of a proxy for them having done work. So if you run a new cipher node for six months and you produced, you know, X amount of inflation would be expected to, to earn during that period, like we will have considered you to have been, you know, available as a node and have done done the work. So the work lock pont contract basically um, during the escrow period, which is open right now, allows anyone to escrow ETH into that contract. And then at the end of the con- uh, work lock period, and once the network launches, everyone will be able to claim some sort of pro rata amount of, of staked new cipher tokens if they escrow it into the work lock contract. And those staked new cipher tokens are obviously locked for at least six months, uh, but it allows them to run a new cipher node. And if they run a new cipher node correctly, eventually they'll be able to recover all of their escrowed ETH. And then the new tokens as well will unlock and become transferable. And what happens is the work clock contract can basically just watch and see is this node earning inflation. If it is, then you know we'll start to unlock uh, some of their escrowed ETH. If it's not, everything will just stay locked uh, until they, they do the work. Okay, so so you really have to do the work, otherwise your your ETH will, will get locked up forever. Yep. Yeah, if you if you escrow ETH and you don't run a node, you won't lose your ETH. It doesn't get burned or anything like that and we won't take it. It's just in it's just escrowed into the work lock contract and it will it will stay there until Hopefully, at some point in the future, you come back and you and you run a node and do the work. Okay, interesting. Where, did you find this inspiration? Is this sort of inspired by by other networks doing similar things, or is it something you came up with? Yeah, I would say it was very heavily influenced by what the Live Peer team did with their Merkle mine. So they had uh, an interesting sort of distribution strategy where. Anyone that I think it was I forget what amount, but anyone that had a uh, an ETH balance over a certain amount could pro- basically do this Merkle mine. So they could produce this proof, uh, and they could submit it to the blockchain in exchange for live peer tokens. So it was interesting because it was permissionless. So like anyone could do it. Like it wasn't the live peer team, you know, doing an ICO and deciding who couldn't buy and who couldn't buy. It was kind of this permissionless sort of mimicking of maybe like a you know of mining a token. So that was that sort of permissionless aspect was super interesting to us. And then, like, I think uh, we just wanted to improve upon it a little bit and, and make it sort of more applicable to the new Cypher network. And instead of this like arbitrary Merkle proof that doesn't really, you know, it's just sort of uh, pointless work that's only meant to get live peer tokens, like basically change the work requirement to be something useful for the actual network. So the idea was for it to be the work lock was it for, for it to be permissionless, but also like hopefully like targeting a particular type of uh, token holder in which in this case um, people who will stake the new cipher token and run a node for the network and trying to advantage them over you know people who just want to invest or you know trade or, or, or do things that maybe aren't as useful for the network long term 
Yeah, and it is it is a bit more of a barrier to say something like the Edgeware lock drop, for example, where you just put the tokens in and you know, you're expected to get those tokens in, in return. You actually have to do some work here, and it does create this incentive to you know, actually participate in a network and do something useful rather than just speculate. Yep, exactly. Yeah, it looks a lot like maybe like a sort of combination of the Merkle mine and like a lock drop style sort of Edgeware type of thing. Obviously, like the the barrier to entry is versus a lock drop is higher because you actually have to do the you know to run the node. It's not a passive thing where you escrow your ETH or you signal your ETH, or for that matter, you know, like a lot of the the DeFi farming stuff or yield farming stuff is. Uh, you know, maybe you can draw some parallels there, but it definitely requires like more of an active um, engagement with the network than sort of just passively providing liquidity for a, a DEX or something. Are you mean to? Do you mean to say that yield farmers are not actively doing any any work? <laughs> I'm sure they're doing actually uh, quite a bit of work, but like uh, maybe like uh, sort of technical technical work. <laughs> Providing liquidity is, is valid, I guess. So you know, if there are any you know validator operators out there or people who you know are technical enough to to set up a node, walk us through sort of what's uh, what's required and um, to to set up one of these nodes, and you know what might that cost in terms of like server infrastructure, this sort of thing. Yeah, so a new cipher node itself is is actually very lightweight. So it's you know it's just doing elliptic curve cryptography, which is pretty computationally cheap. Unfortunately, right now, like the probably the biggest piece of uh, the biggest cost for running a new cipher node is is the gas cost. So two hundred k per node per day of, of gas, which I think at recent prices has been like five to ten dollars most days. You know, adds up pretty quickly, especially if you're you know staking the minimum amount. Um, yeah, for six months is. Yeah, for the yeah. work lock especially. So if you're, you know, if you're a larger node or you have a larger stake, maybe it's it's not as bad because you're just spreading it out across um, a, m- a much bigger stake. But if you're staking, let's say, you know, two thousand dollars worth of, of new new tokens, you're probably gonna end up spending that much or almost that much or maybe even a little bit more on gas. So that's tough. But the new cipher node itself pretty cheap. I think like in test nets, people were having pretty good success with like a twenty dollar a month digital ocean droplet for example and then you do have to the ursula nodes do have to have a, an eth node to send these transactions or broadcast these transactions from um, that can be you know a full node that you run locally or you know you can use clef to just remote sign with like uh infura or alchemy or something like this so that's sort of the the considerations um in turning a new cipher to a new cipher node and then for the work lock specifically to participate how that works is during the escrow period, which opened uh, a week ago and lasts until September 28th, so about three more weeks, you can lock up ETH, and there's a minimum uh, ETH lock of, of, of five ETH. And if you put in five ETH, you're guaranteed to at least get the, the minimum new cipher stake of 15,000 new. Then if you, if you lock up more than five ETH, you'll get you know, some amount, amount more. Um, it's, not, it's not linear. There's sort of this um, bonus pool that determines uh, how much ETH you'll get exactly. So it depends on like, the total amount of ETH escrowed and how many people end up participating. But if you do the minimum ETH escrow, you'll at least, get, uh, you'll at least be guaranteed to have enough to, to stake and to run a node. And you have until the 28th to do that escrow. You can cancel it any time during the con- escrow period and for up to two days afterwards if you decide you don't want to run a node anymore. And then once the network launches, you'll be able to basically claim the stake locked new that you're entitled to from the work lock and spin up a node and run a node. Um, and then once you've done that for a su- sufficient amount of time, you'll be able to recover all of your escrowed ETH. You'll be earning sort of new inflation along the way, and you'll also get that stake locked new will um, vest essentially after six months. Hmm. Are, are you concerned that, uh, you know, with with current gas prices that you know the number of nodes that will basically bootstrap the network might not be as high as you would have wished and you know that the network itself is not as decentralized as you know it should be if it's to be reliable and you know is that maybe put into question this the mechanism by which uh, nodes kind of check in so i think for sure because of the gas situation there will be less small nodes Unless somehow between now and you know the end of work lock, like the gas situation gets radically better, which I don't think is going to be the case. So for sure there will be less. Like we probably are not going to have 
you know, a thousand nodes uh, on the network, like we might have had, you know, if the gas situation was better. But I think as of, I haven't looked this morning, but like as of last night, I think there were something like um, 90-ish direct participants so far into the work lock, which means uh, 90 independent nodes. And then we've also seen quite a bit of um, pooling. So one of the reasons, like we, Coinless is basically offering a way to participate in the work lock through their platform. And so they're essentially pooling, you know, people's ETH to run one large node or maybe a couple large nodes. Um, so basically they're able to spread this gas cost across a bunch of users. And so I think we've seen, you know, through Coinlist and, you know, some other pools that have been happening sort of, you know, offline or just, you know, people that are like, have worked with each other in the past, like pooling their ETH to participate and to run, you know, one large node as opposed to a bunch of small nodes. Uh, that's been a kind of a phenomenon that we've been seeing largely driven, I think, by this, uh, this gas, um, gas cost situation. And then uh, separately, we are looking at ways to maybe alleviate the gas, the, the cost of in gas in terms of running a node. So, you know, potentially making the check-in not daily, but, you know, weekly or something like that. Those are potential solutions that we're looking at. But um, I, I think it's sort of not determined yet if, if we'll actually uh, implement any of those. How important is that decentralized check-in? You know, is it, could one just not, you know, sign something and like send it to you guys? Like, you know, and... Well, like, so, like, everything is basically this, uh, this check-in goes to a smart contract, which distributes the inflation. So, like, we, once that smart contract is deployed and it's running, like, we have no ability to really influence it. So people couldn't just, you know, send their check-in to, like, our email address and <laughs> send them inflation. No, but I mean, like, through some API call or something. I mean, like, yeah, ba- basically, it would, it would imply that you have some kind of key that, that does this distribution yeah, model. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so we, we do not. So some of the contracts in the network or in the protocol are, are not upgradable, or most of them are. A few are upgradable, and they are owned, or they will be owned by the, the new Cypher DAO, which is basically composed of the new Cypher stakers. So if enough stakers decided that they wanted to change maybe like the, the check-in requirement from a day to a week, or they wanted to change how quickly the inflation comes out, there are some parameters that the DAO itself can kind of tweak. But it would require, you know, a, a quorum of, of stakers to to agree on that type of change. But yeah, I think uh, right now gas costs is not great. <laughs> it's definitely <laughs> impacting us uh, as the bottom line. Yeah, I mean it's impacting everybody. So what's the business model here, and how how are you guys making money from all this? Sure. So New Cipher, our company at least, will uh, we have some New Cipher tokens. And our business model as a company is that we will be staking some of those tokens and running nodes ourselves. Um, so at, particularly at the beginning, we'll be a, a pretty large staker on the network. But other than that, you know, we'll just be a standard staker. We won't have any other sort of explicit advantage over any other staker. So hopefully the idea is, you know, we'll be on a relatively equal footing with, you know, other, other node operators in the network. You know, and, and if the network is successful in getting a lot of usage and, you know, people are paying paying fees into the network, we would, uh, we would benefit from that along with uh, other stakers and other net operators. Cool. So uh, where, where, can, where should people go to find you to learn more about the work lock? And uh, yeah, any last words? Sure. Um, so newcypher.com. Um, and from there, we link out to all of our channels. Probably Discord is, is the most active one. Um, and that's focused on you know, development and sort of technical aspects of staking. You can also uh, get testnet tokens from the faucet in Discord um, if you want to spin up a, a testnet node and experiment with that um, before mainnet. Our Twitter, um, also we, we tweet out any sort of important updates on work lock or you know, network announcements there. So it's just new cipher at new cipher is our handle there. But yeah, I think the, the starting place is, is newcipher.com. And then uh, we have links to a blog post on, on the work lock and that lays out all of the participation details and requirements and, and timing um, and should have all the sort of the information um, that's relevant um, for participating in the work lock there. Yeah, and we'll link to the uh, we'll link to that blog post as well in the show notes. So if anybody's interested, uh, they can check that out. Cool. Well, thanks, McLean. Thanks for joining us today and telling us all about New Cypher and uh, looking forward to uh, learning more once the work lock period ends and the network launches. Absolutely. Great to be here. Thank you, guys. Thanks. 
Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, the guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week. <laughs>